We are in Ezekiel chapter 40. We continue in our study, of course, of this um, Old Testament book. Before we start, let me sort of skip ahead a bit to what we're going to enter into after we get through with Ezekiel. Uh, we're going to go back in the New Testament. We've been in the Old Testament for a while. So I, my thought is that we would enter into a study of the book of Luke. So be uh, prepared for that. That'll be in several weeks. Once we get through with Ezekiel, we will go into the book of Luke. But we're in verse 7 of chapter 40 is where we left off last time. And we're talking about, or Ezekiel is describing through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the vision which he saw concerning the temple. And this temple, I would uh, stress, was not one that was intended to be built. Now, our premillennial friends would jump up and say, point of order. Oh, yes, this is intended. This temple will be built in Jerusalem in the future. But there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, the, not the least of which is the fact that premillennialism has no scriptural basis. But aside from that fact, when we go through the entire description of this temple, you're going to immediately see some sections of this entire section of Ezekiel that makes it impossible for this temple to be built in the future. And I think it will become very obvious once we enter into those sections of, uh, of uh, Ezekiel. But be that as it may, as we go through all of these symbols, I will freely admit to you that a lot of these symbols, as far as what they mean for us, I have no idea as far as any meaning for us today in the 21st century. I can give you some guess as to what some of these symbols are based on what I have studied from uh, brethren that I trust. Uh, Burton Kaufman, for one, in his commentary, has an excellent dis uh, discussion on the temple, and I rely a good bit on his material in uh, some of my comments that we will make along the way. But there are other brethren that have gone through this section of Ezekiel who will tell you right up front there are things that we cannot understand. Just as is the case of the book of Revelation, there are many of the details of the book of Revelation that I freely admit to not knowing anything about. But I do know that the brethren in the first century knew what those symbols meant. But as it is with Ezekiel, this section beginning in chapter 39 and going on forward to the end of the book, much of what is written are just uh, descriptions of the temple that he sees, but as far as what it means for us, we're just left to our own good guesses. And that's what it will amount to as far as I'm concerned. And if you have any uh, good suggestions as to what some of these symbols make, feel free to raise your hand and make comment because I will be very open to it. Verse 7 is where we are, however. And it says, And every little chamber or lodge was one reed long and one reed broad. Remember that the reed is a royal cubit. So keep that in mind as we go forward. And between the little chambers or lodges were five cubits and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate within was one reed. Now, these chambers, these lodges, who were they for? Most likely they were for the priest or intended for the priest who would serve in this visionary temple. Uh, one person has suggested, I believe it is Burton Kaufman, that because of the narrowness of the gate that this would hearken to the idea that Jesus uh, uses in Matthew 7 about the narrow gate or the narrow way, the straight gate and the narrow way that leads to life. And there might be something to say for that. He measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits, and the post thereof two cubits, and the porch of the gate was inward. And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side. They three were of one measure, and the post had one measure on this side and on that side. And he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate ten cubits, and the length of the gate thirteen cubits. The space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side, and the space was one cubit on that side. And the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. He measured then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. The breadth was five and twenty cubits, door against door. And you say, what does that have anything to do with us? Well, obviously, directly nothing. But one has suggested, and this is simply a suggestion, 
that this may indicate the exactness by which the worship and the work of the Lord's church would be measured, possibly. Uh, take it for what it's worth. They may very well have that suggestion in connection with it. As far as any kind of building intended to be built today, that's a whole other matter. And we will be talking more about that as we go forward. He, measured, he made also posts of, them of three score cubits, even unto the post of the court round about the gate. These posts or pillars within the temple could suggest that those who overcome will now be made pillars in the temple of God. Revelation 3.12 suggests that. So if you're looking at some sort of symbolic meaning, that's a possibility. And from the face of the gate of the entrance under the face of the porch of the inner gate were 50 cubits. And there were narrow or closed windows to the little chambers and to their posts within the gate roundabout and likewise to the arches. And windows were roundabout inward. Now what do these windows represent if they represent anything? Some have suggested this is a light from heaven the light that we receive from God's word when we study and meditate upon it, possibly. And upon each post were palm trees. This is not the first time that we've seen the mention of palm trees in Ezekiel, and it won't be the last. And what significance is there with palm trees? Well, if you turn over to Psalm 92, Psalm 92, 12, David writes, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The Lord has palm trees in connection with uh, his people. And there's a significance with that symbol in connection with this vision. Then brought he me into the outward court, and lo, there were chambers, and a pavement made for the court round about. Thirty chambers were upon the pavement, the outer court of this temple. If you know anything about types and antitypes, you know that the outer court symbolizes the world. If you know that could be in connection with the temple of, uh, of uh, uh, the Jews. But this visionary temple has an outer court as well. Verse 18, and the pavement by the side of the gates over against the length of the gates was the lower pavement. Burton Kaufman suggests that the world must be trodden underfoot when we draw near to the Lord. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, then he measured the breadth from the forefront of the lower gate unto the forefront of the inner court without, a hundred cubits eastward and northward. And the gate of the outward court that looked toward the north, he measured the length thereof and the breadth thereof. And the little chambers thereof were three on this side and three on that side. And the posts thereof and the arches thereof were after the measure of the first gate. The length thereof was 50 cubits, and the breadth 25 and 20 cubits. If you count up all these gates, there are 12 gates. And we know the number 12 has a significance for the Israelites, 12 tribes of Israel, of course, 12 sons of Israel. And then it also has significance for us in the New Testament age in that there are 12 uh, original apostles and normally when you talk about the 12, we know who that's referring to. So 12 is a significant number. And their windows and their arches and their palm trees, notice that, were after the measure of the gate that looketh toward the east. And they went up into it by seven steps. That number is not an arbitrary number, by the way. Remember our study of Revelation? Seven is a very significant number for the Jews. That is, it is the perfect number. Seven steps. And the arches thereof were before them. Now, again, Burton Kaufman suggests that the seven steps that go up symbolize Christian growth. As we know from 2 Peter 3, uh, we grow to a perfect man. Well, this could very well symbolize that for us. And the gate of the inner court was over against the gate toward the north and toward the east. And he measured from gate to gate a hundred cubits. After that, he brought me toward the south. And behold, a gate toward the south. And he measured the post thereof and the arches thereof according to these measures. And there were windows in it. 
And the arches thereof round about, like those windows, the length was 50 cubits, and the breadth 5 and 20 cubits, and there were seven steps to go up to it. And the arches thereof were before then, and it had palm trees, one on this side, another on that side, upon the post thereof. And there was a gate in the inner court toward the south. And he measured from gate to gate toward the south a hundred cubits. And he brought me to the inner court by the south gate. And he measured the south gate according to these measures. And the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, according to these measures. And there were windows in it, and in the arches thereof, round about it, it was fifty cubits long, and five and twenty cubits broad. And the arches round about were five and twenty cubits long, and five cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the utter court. And palm trees were upon the post thereof, and the going up to it had eight steps. Notice the similarity of all of these measurements he's just described. Almost exactly the same. Brother Burton Kaufman suggests that the faith of all the saints should be the same. Because we all, of course, have the unity of the faith within the Lord's church, Ephesians 4.12. Could very well be that. And he brought me into the inner court toward the east. And he measured the gate according to these measures. And the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof are according to these measures. And there were windows therein, and the arches thereof round about it. It was 50 cubits long, and 5 and 20 cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the outer court. And palm trees were upon the posts thereof, on this side and on that side. And the going up to it had eight steps. The church, as we know today, must be united in faith and practice, just as these measurements were the same. There was a unity in measurement. We have the unity within the body of Christ today of all matters of faith and practice based upon the New Testament. And he brought me to the north gate and measured according to these measures. The little chambers thereof, the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, and the windows to it round about. The length was 50 cubits and the breadth 5 and 20 cubits. And the posts thereof were toward the utter court, and palm trees were upon the posts thereof on this side and on that side. And the going up to it had eight steps. And the chambers and the entries thereof were by the post of the gates where they washed the burnt offering. Now notice that. For our premillennial friends that say this temple is going to be built in Jerusalem at the end of time when Jesus comes to the earth to reign on David's throne for a thousand years, you got a problem with that. If this is to be built in the future, what do you do with this burnt offering? They're going to have a burnt offering? Ah, oh, but there's more, as we will see coming up. We know that the complete sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice, Jesus Christ, has been offered upon the cross. We no longer look toward a sacrifice. That has already taken place. But yet, if we are to believe that this temple is yet to come, then what do you do with this burnt offering? Or uh, where does that fit in the New Testament system of religion? It does not. And then, verse 39, in the porch of the gate were two tables on this side and two tables on that side to slay or kill thereon the burnt offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering. Question, if this temple is yet to come, then what do you do with the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering? Is it literal? If this temple is literal, these offerings have got to be literal. If not, why not? But if it's symbolic, ah, then down goes the idea of premillennialism having a new temple that will take the place of the wailing wall in Jerusalem. You know, everybody's waiting for that great temple to be built because the temple had been destroyed in 8070. Yes, everything goes back to 87, he doesn't. Anyway, all that will come according to the premillennialists in the future. But yet, what do you do with these offerings? You can't make it fit in the New Testament system because there's only one offering that's been made once for all, Jesus Christ upon the cross. Then, verse uh, 41, four tables were on this side and four tables on on that side, by the side of the gate, eight tables whereupon they slew their sacrifices. So if this temple is to be literally built, they've got to literally build these, these tables to kill the burnt offerings, to kill the sacrifices, bring in the animals, 
Bring in all the blood, all that animal blood. And yet I seem to remember the Hebrews writer saying, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Not possible. And yet, if this is not literal, then what is it? I suggest to you it is symbolic. What do these sacrifices represent? They are representations of the spiritual sacrifices that will be made in the temple of God, the church. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's the sacrifice that we make besides, of course, the incense, that is the prayers that we pray to God and the fruit of our lips, the singing that we do is a type of sacrifice that we make to God. When you look at it in that perspective, we offer sacrifices every day we live. The Levitical priesthood offered sacrifices every day. It was an everyday religion. And we as the priesthood of God, all of us who are Christians, male and female, all of us are priests under the great high priest. We offer up sacrifices every day that we live. And then we offer up our worship to God when we gather together as a people. Yes, we offer sacrifices, but it's not bloody sacrifices. Verse 42, And the four tables were of hewn stone for the burnt offering, of a cubit and a half long and a cubit and a half broad and one cubit high, whereupon also they laid the instruments wherewith they slew the burnt offering and the sacrifice. I don't want to belabor the point, but again, if our premillennial friends are correct that this is a literal temple, then you've got to have literal instruments to kill animals. If not, why not? Oh, that's symbolic. Oh, wait a minute, Hoss. You're saying that's symbolic and the rest of it's literal? Now you're going to pick and choose? That's in essence what we're asked to believe. Just like it is in Revelation. You can pick and choose what's literal and what's symbolic. The thousand year reign's literal. Oh, but the army of locusts, that's symbolic. Well, wait a minute. You can't have it both ways. Either it's all symbolic or it's all literal. Same thing with this. If this is a literal temple to be built, this kills it for us. According to the book of Hebrews and the book of Galatians. We continue. And within were hooks. Is that literal? A hand brought, fastened round about, and upon the tables, watch this, was the flesh of the offering. If this is literal, you've got literal animal flesh on these tables ready to be offered up. Where does that fit in to the New Testament system? It does not, it never will. We're under the high priest, Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, not after the Old Testament system. And without the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court, which was at the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south, one at the side of the east gate having the prospect toward the north. Ah, so we've got singers in this temple. What does this represent? Quite obviously, in the church there is singing. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing, making melody to one, and, uh, one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing is part of worship. And that's what this represents. And he said unto me, this chamber, whose prospect is toward the south, is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. So the priests in this vision of this temple were to keep the altar clean. Even so, we as the priesthood of Christ must respect the altar of Christ. When we take the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 30, we are commanded as part of that uh, observance to examine yourself examine how that is examine yourself to make sure that you are taking the supper in a proper way that you are focused upon the death of Jesus as you take the bread and you take the fruit of the vine 
Verse 46, And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. Again, question, if this is to be a literal temple that is to be literally built, how do you determine who the sons of Zadok or, and the sons of Levi are? You can't. There's no way that you can do that. And how does that fit in with the priesthood of Melchizedek in the New Testament system? It doesn't. It has to be representative or symbolic, that is. So he measured the court, that's the inner court, 100 cubits long and 100 cubits broad, four square, and the altar that was before the house. And he brought me to the porch of the house and measured each post of the porch, five cubits on this side and five cubits on that side. And the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. The length of the porch was 20 cubits and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me by the steps whereby they went up to it and there were pillars by the posts, one on this side and another on that side. All of this suggests strength, stability, and order. There is an orderliness all through this description. It's not haphazard. It doesn't, it's not that it doesn't fit, it perfectly fits together. This is, of course, according to divine order. And in the church today, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, suggests that we are to do all things in decency or decently and in order. If you were a student at Freed Hardeman during the 1970s and 80s, every day at the end of chapel, if President E. Claude Gardner was, pre was present that day, he would always cite 1 Corinthians 14, 40. If you didn't know any other verse in the New Testament, you would know 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. But I appreciated him citing that on a regular basis because it emphasized that there is to be an orderliness. There is to be stability. There is to be order within the body of Christ. And that, I believe, is what all of this in general suggests to us. In fact, the entire description all the way through has that strong suggestion to it. Brings us to chapter 41, and he says, Afterward, he brought me to the temple and measured the post, six cubits broad on the one side, and six cubits broad on the other side, which was the breadth of the tabernacle. And the breadth of the door was ten cubits, and the sides of the door were five cubits on the one side, and five cubits on the other side. And he measured the breadth throughout forty cubits, and the, the length throughout forty cubits, and the breadth twenty cubits. Then went he inward and measured the post of the door, two cubits. And there were six cubits, and the breadth of the door, seven cubits. So he measured the length thereof, 20 cubits, and the breadth, 20 cubits before the temple. And he said unto me, this is the most holy place. The most holy place. Again, if this temple is to be literally built, what do you do with the most holy place? Wasn't that taken out of the way and nailed to the cross in Gal according to Galatians 5? According to Colossians 2? When Jesus died on the cross, what happened within the temple? The veil of the temple was rent in two, torn in two from top to bottom, signifying the way to the temple of God was now open for all people, unencumbered, unfettered. And yet we are shown here in this vision the most holy place. It is an exact square, just as 1 Kings 6 indicates, and Revelation 21, talking about New Jerusalem, the holy city. The measurement of it is an exact square. I think it is no coincidence that the description here in this section of Ezekiel and the description of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22 are similar in many aspects. I think this is talking about, all this section is talking about the church and, of course, heaven itself. As is the case of Revelation 21 and 22, I believe there's a twofold meaning there with the glorified state of the church and heaven. And no, it's not going to be on earth. 
it really, it really distresses me to see some of my younger preacher friends and many others for that matter who are going into this notion, and I would say it's a foolish notion, of believing that he heaven is going to be a reconstituted earth. And they buy into this because there are current New Testament scholars who are promoting that viewpoint. And there are certain educators among us who are promoting that viewpoint. And it's being bought hook, line, and sinker by too many. Well, folks, if heaven is nothing more than a reconstituted earth, then that's a big disappointment for me. It is a big come down. I'm looking for something better. I'm looking for a new Jerusalem. I'm looking for heaven itself. When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and do what? Receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But yet we're to believe it's right here on earth. Deliver me from such a belief system. Well, this right here, I believe, this entire section, is talking about the church and could possibly be talking about the heavenly abode in a symbolic sense. After he measured the wall of the house six cubits, and the breadth of every side chamber four cubits, round about the house on every side, and the side chambers were three, one over another, and thirty in order, and they entered into the wall which was of the house with the side chambers round about, that they might have hold, but they had not hold in the wall of the house, and there was an enlarging, and a winding about still upward to the side chambers. For the winding about of the house went still upward round about the house. Therefore, the breadth of the house was still upward, and so increased from the lowest chamber to the highest by the midst. I saw also the height of the house round about, or a raised basement is what the Hebrew text actually says there. The foundations of the side chambers were a full reed of six great cubits. The thickness of the wall, which was for the side chamber without, was five cubits. And that which was left was a place of the side chambers that were within. And between the chambers was the wideness of 20 cubits round about the house on every side. And the doors of the side chambers were toward the place that was left, one door toward the north and another door toward the south. And the breadth of the place that was left was five cubits round about. Now... This section is illustrative of the fact that there's much that we don't understand about this temple. I will freely admit that. If you have an adequate explanation as to why this is here and what it represents, I'm open to it. But the fact is, there's a lot that I don't understand about this temple. But there's one thing I do understand. This is not meant to be built in the future. Some people point to this detail and say that such detail has got to be built. Well, if it's got to be built in the future, again, what do you do in the previous chapter with the sacrifices and the flesh for the sacrifices? It's got to be symbolic. Else, down goes the New Testament system. Down goes the priesthood of Melchizedek. If not, why not? Verse 12. Now the building that was before the separate place at the end toward the west was 70 cubits there broad. And the wall of the building was, was five cubits thick round about and the length thereof 90 cubits. So he measured the house 100 cubits long, the separate place and the building with the walls thereof 100 cubits long. Also the breadth of the face of the house of the separate place toward the east 100 cubits. And he measured the length of the building over against the separate place which was behind it. And the galleries thereof on the one side and on the other side 100 cubits with the inner temple and the porches of the court, the doorposts and the narrow or closed windows, and the galleries round about on their three stories over against the door, sealed with wood round about, and from the ground up to the windows, and the windows were covered, to that above the door, even unto the inner house and without, and by all the wall round about within and without by measure. All of it orderly. All of it exactly uh, to measurements as the Lord determined. Verse 18. And so it was made with cherubims and palm trees. So that a palm tree was between a cherub and a cherub. And every cherub had two faces. So that the face of a man was toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. It was made through all the house round about. Interestingly, you turn back over to 1 Kings chapter 6. And in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 29, talking about the temple of Solomon. 
It says, and he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers within and without. So you got cherubims and palm trees in the, in the temple of Solomon, and in this visionary temple, you've got cherubims and palm trees. And these cherubims have two faces, one of a man and one of a lion. But the Rex Turner Sr., in his book, Systematic Theology, which has been since revised by Amherst, and now it's biblical theology, uh, the revisions are just additions of footnotes throughout. But still, Brother uh, Turner, in his section on angels, angelology, toward the end of that section, and I remember him talking about this in class, said that there needs to be detailed study in the future of cherubims and seraphims and the orders of angels. It's a fascinating study. Edward P. Myers has a very good study on angels that's available if you want to order it through Gospel Advocate. I highly recommend Brother Turner's book, of course. Uh, his section on angels is outstanding. Uh, and this right here mentions the cherubs, the cherubim, as it is called in other places, the seraphim in other sections. But here you got cherubs on the walls of the temples with palm trees. And these two faces indicates the surety of victory. Victory over evil. Uh, man, of course, suggesting intelligence and the lion suggesting bravery or courage. From the ground unto above the door were cherubims and palm trees made and on the wall of the temple. The posts of the temple were square to the face of the sanctuary, the appearance of the one as the appearance of the other. The altar of wood was three cubits high and the length thereof two cubits, and the corners thereof and the length thereof and the walls thereof were of wood. And he said unto me, this is the table that is before the Lord. Question, if this is to be literal, as we've already said, you've got a problem with the New Testament system. But if this altar is to be literally built, then the first major sacrifice on that altar would burn that altar completely up. Because it's made of wood. Wood burns. Every altar that we see throughout the Old Testament system is overlaid with bronze or overlaid with gold or overlaid with some kind of metallic substance. Why? So the altar will not be consumed when the offering is offered up. This has no such protection. This altar must be representative of something greater. This, I believe, represents spiritual sacrifices that would be made within the temple of God today, the church. And the temple and the sanctuary had two doors. And the doors had two leaves apiece, two turning leaves. Two leaves for the one door and two leaves for the other door. And they were made on them, the doors of the temple, cherubims and palm trees, like as were made upon the walls. And there were thick planks upon the face of the porch without. And there were narrow windows and palm trees on the one side and on the other side, on the sides of the porch and upon the side chambers of the house, and thick planks. Now, if you're looking for some kind of symbolism for us, 1 Peter 3, 4 tells us that the uh, living temple is adorned with the hidden man of the heart. If you're looking for some sort of representation, that's a possibility. We adorn the hidden man of the heart. We are part of the living temple, the temple of God today. Chapter 42. We're going a little bit quicker for obvious reasons through this section. Then he brought me forth into the utter or outer court, the way toward the north, and he brought me into the chamber that was over against the separate place, and which was before the building toward, uh, toward the north. Before the length of a hundred cubits was the north door, and the breadth was fifty cubits. Over against the twenty cubits, which were for the inner court, and over against the pavement, which was for the utter or outer court, was gallery against gallery in three stories. Now, what does this represent, these chambers, these galleries? Well, the worship of God is not to be confined to just public worship today. 
But worship ought to include private devotions. Isn't that what Jesus suggests in Matthew 6, 5, and 6 in the Sermon on the Mount? And we obviously know that a child of God can worship God anywhere he chooses, in private or in public. This is possibly what this suggests. And before the chambers was a walk of ten cubits breadth inward, a way of one cubit, and their doors toward the north. Now the upper chambers were shorter, for the galleries were higher than these, and the lower, and then the middlemost of the building. For they were in three stories, but had not pillars as the pillars of the courts. Therefore the building, or uppermost, was straightened more than the lowest and the middlemost from the ground. And the wall that was without over against the chambers toward the utter court on the fore part of the chambers, the length thereof was fifty cubits. For the length of the chambers that were in the utter court were fifty cubits, and lo, before the temple were a hundred cubits. And from under these chambers was the entry on the east side, as one goeth into them from the utter court. The chambers were in the thickness of the wall of the court toward the east, over against the separate place and over against the building. And the way before them was like this. Appearance of the chambers, which were toward the north, as long as they and as broad as they, or according to their length as the breadth, and all their goings out were both according to their fashions and according to to their doors. Now what does all of this suggest? If you picture this in your mind in some way, you see that there is a proximity of the chambers to each other and to the main section of the temple. This could suggest social contact so that those that were in this temple, involved in this temple, could have common knowledge and common experiences. And if you look for a connection for the church, you know that we, of course, have social contact with one another. We have fellowship with one another in worship and in work and, of course, our love and devotion for each other and for the Lord. And according to the doors of the chambers that were toward the south was adorned the head of the way, even the way directly before the wall toward the east as one entereth into them. Then said he unto me, the north chambers and the south chambers, which are before the separate place, they be holy chambers, here's the purpose of it, where the priests that approach unto the Lord shall eat the most holy things. There shall they lay the most holy things, and the meat or meal offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. If this is for today, literally, how do you fit that in? You can't. There's no difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean physically today. We are to make a difference between holy and profane things, yes. But as far as food, no. As far as literal things, no. The purpose there is for those priests. We are the priesthood of God. And we are to make a distinction between what is holy and what's not. But there's no sin offering, meal offering, and trespass offering. That's gone. When the priests enter therein, then shall they not go out of the holy place and the other court, but then shall they lay their garments wherein they minister. For they are holy and shall put on other garments and shall approach to those things which are for the people. This reminds me of when I went into the Mormon temple in Gardendale and we were told to put little slippers upon, uh, over our shoes because we didn't need to defile the holy temple. And we went into the first room where the people, the Mormons that came into that temple were to change out of their clothes into their holy garments. We don't have that today in the Lord's church. This that's described in verse 14 must be symbolic. It cannot be literal. Otherwise, you've destroyed the New Testament system. You've destroyed the New Testament pattern of worship, and you've destroyed the priesthood of Melchizedek completely. All of this is symbolic, and we've got to take it as such. Otherwise, you have got a mess, a mess and a half for the future. How do you fit it in? You can't. It's got to be talking about the church. Well, our time is gone, so we're going to have to end up right here. We'll take up with our study next week with verse 15 of chapter 42 and we'll keep on going.